This is the Seminole Wars Authority. Hello and welcome. We have devoted several episodes in our podcast to the fort at Prospect Bluff, known best as the Negro Fort on the Apalachicola River in Florida's Panhandle. During the War of 1812, the British also built a smaller fort, which historians dub Nichols Outpost. They and their Seminole allies used this as a base to conduct offensive operations into Georgia and Alabama during that conflict. Seminole Indians later used it to stage attacks on the U.S. Army in the First Seminole War. And historian Dale Cox, he's here to tell us all about it. Dale Cox, welcome back to the Seminole Wars Authority. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Dale, what was Nichols' outpost or fort, and why is it important? The one that most people call Nichols Outpost, and you're correct to call it Nichols Fort, was a second fort that was built on the Apalachicola by the British during the War of 1812. And although it receives much less attention, it was equally important because it was the northernmost fort built by the British during the War of 1812, during what we would call the New Orleans Campaign. It seems kind of sneaky putting constructing forts in neutral Spanish territory right on the border with the Americans. It was in the Spanish colony of West Florida. It put them literally right up on the border of the United States. This fort was built one mile south of the Georgia border, and it was put in a position where they could launch raids into Georgia against the Georgia frontier, which they did. They launched raids that reached as far north as the outskirts of Milledgeville, Georgia, which for anyone who's familiar with the geography of Georgia, that's way up into the heart of Georgia today. It also was significant because it created a point to which Maroons or self-liberated slaves could go to right on the border of Spanish Florida. They could reach that point, and then they could move deeper into Spanish Florida for their security. This fort was highly significant. It was, however, one that history kind of forgot as time passed and we moved into the 20th and 21st centuries. And because it was not later blown up by the United States, time just sort of forgot about it. Spain at that time was a neutral country and had not taken sides in the War of 1812. However, the United States seized Mobile, which was a Spanish city. So Spain did not look favorably upon that and invited the British to station troops in West Florida after the United States did that. Spain still, on the whole, was a neutral country. However, Spanish troops did not have the strength they needed to defend the Spanish cities. Spain was concerned that the United States might invade further into West Florida, might try to seize more territory. So they did invite the British to occupy Pensacola. They did turn the other way when the British built these two forts on the Apalachicola River, the one at Prospect Bluff and the one that was one mile below the forks of the Chattahoochee and Flint Rivers. Dale, what is the timeline here? There were troops on the Apalachicola as early as May of 1814 at both of these locations. The actual construction of these forts took place beginning in about November of 1814. Where is this occupation in relation to the attack on Prospect Bluff? So we're talking about, say, a month prior to the Battle of New Orleans. The Battle of New Orleans, the first fighting took place in December of 1814. And then, of course, the big battle was on January 8th, 1815. We're looking at a month or two prior to the Battle of New Orleans. Not that long prior to the Battle of New Orleans, they began building the actual defenses of these forts when the British moved most of their troops, began doing the big landing south of New Orleans or south of Chalmette to begin the attack uh, south of New Orleans. What were the differences between the purposes for these two forts? The one south, immediately south of the border, was created more as a base for offensive operations It was designed to provide the British and their Native American allies as a launching point for attacks into Georgia. The one at Prospect Bluff was originally designed as a defensive post, 
It was designed to provide a place for the Native American women and children to be in security while the warriors went off to fight. Uh, So it was designed more really as a depot where the women and children could be, where supplies could be gathered. It was not really designed as a point from which offensive operations were going to be launched. The second fort, however, this one that is today called Nichols Outpost, was designed as this is the point from which we're going to launch offensive operations into the United States. Were there American operations against these forts? Well, there actually was. In 1815, there was an American offensive operation against the northern of these two forts. Benjamin Hawkins led a group of about 900 Creek warriors from Kawita and some of the upper lower Creek towns, which I know sounds you know kind of weird to say it that way, but from some of the Creek towns up around the falls of the Chattahoochee River, which is today's Columbus, Georgia, they came down the Chattahoochee River intending to attack this upper fort. When they arrived there, they found out that it was stronger than they expected. They got there, they found that it's well entrenched, that it's got a good stockade walls, that it has artillery. They didn't come down the river with any artillery. They get there, they're expecting to be joined by American militia from Georgia. Suddenly, at the same time, the British invade Cumberland Island on the Georgia coast. They seize the town of St. Mary's. And the Georgia militia is diverted to deal with this invasion over on the Atlantic coast. And so uh, Colonel Hawkins finds himself without any supporting militia. Instead of a couple of thousand men, as he was expecting to have, he only has about 900 Creek warriors, very little ammunition, very few supplies. He has no meat to feed his troops with. He has very little flour. And suddenly he's in danger of being overwhelmed himself. The British are pouring troops up the river to oppose him. They send, uh, actually send a sloop up the river with artillery on it as well. And instead of being on the offensive, Hawkins finds himself on the defensive. The British are preparing to attack him. At that moment, a British vessel comes up the river with a white flag, and with it they have news of the Treaty of Ghent that the war is over. The battle that is expected to happen is avoided just by literally hours. What could have been the last big battle of the War of 1812 is averted there. Yeah, we said it. Why was Nichols Fort more a fort than an outpost? It really was a fort. It's called Nichols Outpost today, I think, because in the 1950s, some of the people who studied it thought, well, this fort at Prospect Bluff was the major fort, so this must have been an outpost that was built off of it. But more recent study of it reveals that it really was a significant fort that was built there at the forks of the Chattahoochee and Flint Rivers. And the more we learn about it, the more we realize that, in fact, the majority of the colonial Marines, these were the African troops who the British raised from the self-liberated slaves from Spanish Florida in the United States. The majority of them were actually stationed at this upper fort, the one at the forks of the Chattahoochee and Flint Rivers. They had about 300 troops that they raised or about three companies worth of troops. Two of those companies were stationed at this upper fort. Also, Nichols Company of Royal Marines were stationed there. And they had, at the major point, about 800 of their Native American allies were stationed up there. So they were reaching a point approaching somewhere around 1,200 troops that they had stationed at this upper fort. It also had a majority of their field artillery was there. They had sent some vessels up the river that far that they were going to use to support the invasion into Georgia. And they were sending these war parties of Seminole and Creek, Red Stick Creek warriors into Georgia that were penetrating deep into Georgia and carrying out raids to help slaves self-liberate and come down. They were taking cattle and horses from up in Georgia and bringing them down to the British on the Apalachicola. It was absolutely a significant fort that they had built at what today we know of as Chattahoochee River Landing Park. Did this deter an attack on the fort at Prospect Bluff? Yes, it did for at least a year. 
It deterred any American attack on uh, the Fort at Prospect Bluff, which in 1815 is where the majority of the non-combatants were. That's where all of the Red Stick women and children were located at that time. And along with the Maroon women and children, they were down at Prospect Bluff. So it prevented an attack that could have been a real humanitarian catastrophe if the Americans had come on down the river and attacked the Fort at Prospect Bluff in 1815. It would have been as bad as it was in 1816 when it happened, when you had 270 men, women, and children killed. It could have been much worse had it happened in 1815 when you had as many as 3,500 women and children down there. After the Treaty of Ghent, the peace treaty ostensibly ending the War of 1812, what changed? When the British withdrew from the river in late May of 1815, so far as we know, when they evacuated their troops from the river, the upper fort was abandoned at that time. We have not found any information to indicate that it continued to be occupied. We do know that they withdrew their artillery from it. And so far as we know, the fort was abandoned at that time, the upper fort. The lower fort is where the Maroons who remained on the river concentrated the Seminole and Creek warriors evacuated out to their villages and towns in the area. It would have been around May and June of 1815. It prevented there being a fight at the upper end of the river, so there was not that upper fort to def help create sort of a staged defense, which would have happened had there been an American, and did happen when there was an American attempt to come down the river one year earlier. When Colonel Hawkins tried to come down the river one year earlier, there was this British stage to defense where you had this upper fort that stopped the American campaign dead in its tracks when it reached the forks of the Chattahoochee and Flint Rivers. They were unable to penetrate down the Apalachicola River because they arrived at the forks, and here's this first fort that stopped them, and they got nowhere near Prospect Bluff. So what was different in 1816? When they tried again in 1816, this upper fort had been evacuated by that point, so they were able to sail right past it and go on down the river and attack Prospect Bluff. The treaty said the British were going to leave and go home. They very clearly say this in their various correspondence prior to and after news came to them of the Treaty of Ghent that these forts were built specifically for the use of their Native American allies. And so when they evacuated the Fort at Prospect Bluff and turned it over to their allies, they very specifically had said all along that they were building this for their Creek and Seminole allies. In their mind, this fort had been built for their allies, and they saw nothing wrong with leaving it in the hands of their allies. The upper fort had been built as strictly as a British military post, and I think that's why they evacuated it and abandoned it and went on back down to Prospect Bluff. So we say it's Nichols Outpost, Nichols Fort. Who was Nichols? Well, Colonel Nichols, he was actually a brevet major in the Royal Marines. Fighting Nichols was his nickname in the British military because he had fought in over 100 actions in hand-to-hand -hand combat, which is a fairly remarkable thing, I think, as anyone who has spent any time in the military will tell you that most people never see hand-to-hand -hand action. And here's a guy who had been in hand-to-hand -hand combat over 100 times. He had been wounded many, many times in the service of his king. In fact, just in the War of 1812, he was struck by a grape shot in the eye, which is a fairly gruesome injury that he received just during the War of 1812. He was a very courageous soldier. He was a brevet major in the Marine Corps, which was a very high-ranking office in the Marine Corps. He was an abolitionist. He was a very, very determined to help the Native Americans defend their lands, and he served both on the Apalachicola River during the War of 1812, but he also was present at the Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812. He commanded these Native American auxiliaries, and he commanded a battalion of colonial Marines, which were raised largely 
of self-liberated slaves. Not entirely. There were a variety of other individuals who also served in this battalion, but they were predominantly self-liberated slaves who took part in uh, forming this battalion. That's who he was. His name was spelled N-I-C-O-L-L-S. He was an Irishman, and that's kind of the typical Irish way of spelling Nichols, which is a little different than the English and the American way of spelling Nichols as we know it. Was he the one who oversaw construction, or was it commander? He was there. He oversaw the construction of it. He came and went. He was at New Orleans part of the time. He was at Prospect Bluff part of the time, and he was out with the fleet part of the time. Uh, So he came and went between uh, these various places. It never really had that name. It was normally called just the upper fort by the British. The Americans called it Fort Apalachicola. But neither of these forts ever really were given a name by the British. They called the lower one the Bluff or Prospect Bluff. They called the upper one the Fort or the Upper Fort. The British didn't go to the extremes of naming forts that we in the United States do. The first thing U.S. Army did back in those days was name the fort even before it was built. We think of the British as being overly formal, but as far as naming places, they weren't. They just called it the bluff or the fort, and the upper one they called the fort or the upper fort. Americans, however, were much quicker to name places than the British were back in those days. All right, so how did it get the name that we're using today? The Americans at the time called it Fort Apalachicola. The historian Mark F. Boyd coined the term Nichols Outpost in the 1950s. That's pretty much how the name came about. It stuck. And so because so many historians have used that term, that's the name I used when I wrote the book, Nichols Outpost. The Fort at Prospect Bluff, of course, was obliterated. But what about Nichols Outpost at that time? It was still there, and the Americans referred to it in 1817 during the First Seminole War. They mentioned that when the attack was made on Lieutenant Scott's command on November 30th, 1817, they mentioned that this attack took place at Fort Apalachicola. They don't mention specifically that the attack was made from the fortifications, but they mention Fort Apalachicola as being the location of the attack, which I find interesting because it does help us pinpoint exactly where the site of the Scott battle was. Several of the survivors and several of the officers who wrote about in letters or in their journals or in other reports who wrote about the Scott battle, which was the first U.S. defeat and the first Seminole victory of all of the Seminole Wars, those officers and various people who wrote about it described it as taking place one mile below the confluence of the Chattahoochee and Flint Rivers at Fort Apalachicola, which was this Nichols Outpost structure. During the War of 1812, there were two of the three Colonial Marine companies who were stationed at Nichols Outpost, at least for most of the time that it was occupied. And so they were very familiar with it. And after Nichols evacuated and after the destruction of the forted Prospect Bluff, this was a well-known location to the individuals who by this time had become known as Black Seminoles and who today many people refer to as Black Seminoles. Among these would be Abraham and Nero and some other well-known individuals. After the U.S. attacks on Fowltown, When a decision was made by the Prophet Francis and Peter McQueen and other leaders of the Seminoles and the Red Sticks at this time to try to cut off U.S. traffic on the Apalachicola River, one of the places they decided to use as a choke point was this uh, sharp curve of the Apalachicola River one mile below the confluence of the Chattahoochee and Flint. And this is where this outpost had been constructed or this fort had been constructed. And so they positioned themselves there. And I think it was a logical point, and they very well may have used these remaining trenches to shelter themselves during the attack. They also were described as positioning themselves along several hundred yards of the riverbank at this site. 
it shows just how effective and how strategic of a point it was that Nichols had selected for building this fort, because when the U.S. keelboat commanded by Lieutenant Scott came up the river, the attack was extremely successful. In their first volley of fire, they killed almost all the soldiers or severely wounded almost all the soldiers who were on the boat. And the boat drifted ashore, and they were able to take it with very few casualties on their own side. It showed that Nichols, his selection of this site was clearly a very good military decision. It was a very good military position. Part of the whole strategy that the Prophet Francis and others employed during the First Seminole War was to choke off supplies going to Fort Scott. The points they selected were all intended to blockade the Apalachicola River, and this fort was one of the locations that they used. It was not really occupied as much as a military post as it was just because it was clearly a good strategic point. But we know that the fort survived well on into the 1820s and 1830s because there are other eyewitness accounts of it, the trenches still surviving right on into the territorial era of the United States. In fact, there is some evidence today that you can still see there atop one of the large Native American mounds at Chattahoochee River Landing Park. You can still see some slight traces of it still today. Did the Americans use that site as a holding area for people like Abraham after the attack on the fort at Prospect Bluff, or was it at Fort Scott? So the United States held them at Fort Scott. After the destruction of the fort at Prospect Bluff, Abraham and those who were held prisoner briefly were taken to Fort Scott, but they were released within just a few months. And then they went and joined the, the Maroons who were at Nero's town. And then they came back and used this, this Nichols outpost structure as an offensive point to attack U.S. troops that were coming up the river in 1817. Yes. Why did this book, Nichols Outpost, need to be written? It needed to be written because so many people were familiar with the Fort at Prospect Bluff or the Negro Fort, as it used to be commonly called, but no one knew about the second fort. It really was a significant site. The second fort was actually the British offensive post. This was the post where they were going to launch their offensive operations into Georgia. It was significant in terms of the southbound Underground Railroad. This was where many self-liberated slaves were coming from Georgia into Spanish Florida during the War of 1812. And that made it significant, if for no other reason, than the fact that many people gained their freedom by reaching this location. It also was a point during the War of 1812 where many of these frontier raids had actually hit Georgia during the War of 1812. This is where those raids came from. It was the northernmost point reached by the British during the New Orleans campaign. It was one of only two British posts built in Florida during the War of 1812. When you start to add all of those things together, that makes it a very significant military site in Florida, and nothing had really ever been written about it other than a bit of a chapter in one book about historic sites around Lake Seminole, and other than that, a few lines here and there. And I thought this is deserving of a much bigger treatment, and so that's what I gave it. So what's your big takeaway? The big takeaway was that it was the northernmost British post established during the New Orleans campaign, and that it was relatively successful, even though they never launched the major campaign from there that they anticipated. They were able to launch raids that reached hundreds of miles into U.S. territory. They reached to the South Carolina line than they were to the Florida line which I think is fairly remarkable. It was a point where there were more of the Maroon or the Colonial Marine troops than there actually were at Prospect Bluff. It was a significant point on the southbound Underground Railroad. There's a lot that remains to be learned about it, but we were also able to pinpoint its location, which was unknown at the time that the book was written. And we were able to prompt archaeological work, which has been done there now. That archaeological work included ground-penetrating radar, which found parts of stockade trenches and things like that, and now has led to future archaeological work, which will take place there in the form of more geophysical 
type work. And the current project that is taking place there right now has already found gun flints, musket balls, things like that. Also, what's really great is that we were able to secure federal funding in the wake of Hurricane Michael that has led to uh, partial restoration of the Native American mound that it sits on. So not only are we stabilizing the site of Nichols Outpost, but we're preserving thousand-year-old Native American mound so that it will be preserved, hopefully, for another thousand years. We'll be able to show respect for that Native American site, and we'll be able to do future archaeology there in a way that does not disturb those prehistoric Native American site and remains. And so future archaeology will be done in a geophysical way that uses things like ground penetrating radar and sensing and things like that so that everything that is done there is done respectfully. And we've been able to involve Seminole Tribe of Florida in the work there so that everybody is working together to treat the site with respect so that people aren't putting shovels into Native American mounds and doing things that might be disrespectful to the dead who are buried there. What government entity oversees the remains of this outpost? It is owned by the city of Chattahoochee. And the city of Chattahoochee has done a wonderful job of developing this as a heritage destination, as well as an outdoor location where people can go and fish and boat and do things like that. There are interpretive panels there. The site is well-preserved. It's just a beautiful location. It's right off US 90 in Chattahoochee on River Landing Drive. There are markers and interpretive panels. There's a great archeological and preservation project underway there right now. How have you organized your book? The book is organized just to tell the story in a chronological way from the arrival of the British and what led the British to come there all the way through the building of the fort and then through the evacuation of the fort all the way up to the archaeology that has taken place and the recent discoveries there. Now, talk about the research that went into this. There's a huge amount of research that went into it through the National Archives of Great Britain, through the papers of Admiral Alexander Cochran, through Colonel Nichols' papers in his journal. There's been a huge amount of work done in the papers of Colonel Benjamin Hawkins, who led the American campaign against the fort, through Andrew Jackson's papers at the Library of Congress, through the British National Archives have been wonderful because there we were able to find some of the writings of the Red Stick Creeks and some of the Seminoles who conducted councils and meetings and produced letters that were written at Nichols Outpost. We found reports from some of the American spies who went inside of Nichols Outpost and sent reports back to Colonel Hawkins. We also found reports from some of the British spies who were Creek warriors who went into the American camps and sent reports back to Colonel Nichols. And so the two sides were both using Native Americans to spy on each other. We found the reports from each side, from the spies uh, that each side was sending into the camps of the other side. It's been a fascinating adventure into the past. And I think people will really enjoy reading it because the way I write is I try to use the words of the people who were there and then just use my dialogue to weave between paragraphs that were written by the people who were there. How much more accessible are these files than they were in other times? It is much more accessible in a way, but much of it was done literally as you would have had to do it 30 years ago because Much of it is still not online. A lot of it took literally doing it, gumshoe detective work, the way you had to do it 30 years ago, because a lot of the British material is not online. You still have to go and dig through the archives and get your fingers dusty or get the white gloves dusty, as you would have to say, because you wear the white gloves to go through the historical records. Dale, how about people? Were you able to interview people who knew about these events? I was able to make contact with a lot of relatives of the British officers who were involved in this expedition. One great thing about some of these British families is they're very into the stories of their ancestors, and they preserve their letters and their records and their diaries. So because of that, I was able to find Colonel Nichols' journal, 
and his diaries and things like that, and some of the papers of some of the other British officers. It, it enabled me to fill out the story. I was also able to learn a lot more about Captain Woodbine, who was his second in command, who was a very bizarre individual who, in the case of the War of 1812, was fighting to liberate people from slavery, but who later died in a slave uprising and was killed by people he had himself enslaved. Through all of that, you learn that people can be very strange creatures at different times in their lives. I was able to tell a more complete story about some of these individuals, I think, than it had ever been told before. What surprised you from the research that you obtained? learning who people like Woodbine really were and who Nichols really was. Doing this book enabled me, because this was a book that was written prior to the Ford at Prospect bluff, but it opened the door to a huge amount of information that I then used in writing the Ford at Prospect bluff book, which tells the story, of course, of the explosion at Prospect bluff. And I've just expanded this book to add two new chapters to it. So I mean, the hardback uh, edition that is coming out has two additional chapters in it. A huge amount of British material that I think people did not previously know existed or maybe knew existed but didn't know how to get their hands on it. That was part of it, the knowing and discovering the con connection between uh, the Apalachicola River and Trinidad. But that book will be released in hardback in December. And I want our listeners to know, usually the hardback comes first and then a paper or a soft cover. Dale, you've got it reversed. Why is that? Normally the first edition is, but in independent publishing, sometimes it goes the other way around. So it came out in paperback. It will be out in hardback in December under the publisher. The publisher's going to release it as a hardback. So, What did you discover after you published the softback version? And how so many of these people who... Uh, were self-liberated slaves who occupied these forts who then went and settled in Trinidad in 1815. Um, and their descendants still live there today. Um, that is a remarkable story that has not been told fully yet. And hopefully one day will be. Either I'll get around to having the time to tell it one day or a different writer will. But it's a remarkable story how all of these people who self-liberated themselves from slavery and lived on the Apalachicola River, and then nearly 1,000 of them all picked up, boarded ships, and moved, evacuated to Trinidad and settled in freedom in Trinidad in 1815. So many of them were married to Native Americans, to Seminoles and Creeks who went with them. Now their descendants live in Trinidad. And that's a story that very few people know, but that deserves to be told. Our listeners should know that the hardback contains two additional chapters, as well as cleaning up some areas where there's typos and things of that nature. Yeah, you know, we corrected some typos in, in the new edition um, and, uh, you know, some things like that. Um, the, we were able to add much more about the Maroons and the Black Seminoles as more people know them. I don't know that there was anything really that someone came forward and said, you missed this or anything. It was more a case of additional research revealing new information. One of the things was that Trinidad connection that I just talked about that came to light after the book was written. We were able to tell more about that. We were able to tell much more about the fort's role in the Underground Railroad and to talk more about that in the new edition. There's much more about that in it, much more about the archaeology of the fort that we were able to add in the new edition because there's been much more archaeology done since the first edition was written. But the first edition is what led to us being able to get the state grants that we needed to do that archaeology. And by having the first edition written, that gave us much of the documentation that we needed to then help the city of Chattahoochee, to help Chattahoochee Main Street go to Florida Division of Historical Resources and apply for those grants and say, here's the documentation. Now help us do the archaeology to learn more about this site, to learn more about what happened here, and to tell the story better, help us to put up more historical interpretation at the site so people can come and learn about it.
that's another thing that the book did was help to inform the community itself about what a valuable historical site it had there. And the community has responded in a wonderful way by developing this just beautiful heritage park on the site. And I think there's 11 interpretive panels that have been placed there now that are National Park Service quality interpretive panels that have been placed on the site, along with three of the metal historical markers that have been placed there. And the city does a wonderful job of maintaining it, and the Chattahoochee Police Department patrols it to prevent looting and things like that. It's just a beautiful park now. And then, just for the record, what are the two chapters that you've added? One is about the Maroons of Nichols Outpost, which deals with, as I said, the Underground Railroad significance of the site. And another one is about the archaeology of the site. Have you had to revise the conclusions for your book? No, no. The conclusions are relatively the same. And then throughout the book, there are some additional paragraphs that were added through the book that add new information. And we added some new sources through the book and things like that. And so the book as a whole is quite a bit longer than the original version. Dale, we're recording in November 2022. And yet there's new information coming out about these forts. Tell us about it. Well, the one thing that we talked about was the uh, announcement that we had found part of the stockade of Fort Gadsden down at Prospect Bluff. That surprised a lot of people to know that here's this 204-year-old log stockade. Part of was found still sticking up above the ground um, at the Fort Gadsden site. This is part of the American fort that dates from the first Seminole War at Fort Gadsden. It's only visible at times of very low water. So at times of the normal river stage, you don't see it because it's actually underwater. But when the water goes down very low, it is possible to see this stock line of stockade posts that are sticking up there at the fort. And I don't know of another Seminole War fort in Florida where part of the log stockade is actually sticking up above ground. You might know, but, but I'm not familiar with one. You say Fort Gadsden. Were any parts of this used in the old British fort? Part of the forward or the point at the front of the fort is kind of a five-sided fort. On the river side of the fort, there is a point that sticks out. It's an earthwork point that was the gun battery of the fort that overlooks the river. That part was built by the British, but the rest of it was designed and built by the U.S. Army. And on that side of the fort, there were two log stockades that went down from the bastions of the fort, went down to the river to close the flanks so that no one could get between the river and and this front of the fort so that they could come down and go up over the river wall of the fort. And this log stockade that was found was one of these log stockades that closed off these flanks of the fort. It was in an area near where the bake oven of the fort was. And we actually found it from a boat. We were coming up the river, and we saw this row of logs. And at first, we thought, well, those are very strange-looking cypress knees to be all in a row like that. And I thought, those can't be cypress knees. That has to be part of the log stockade. It's amazing to think that there could be a log stockade there, but it can't be cypress knees. It has to be. And so we rushed to get on shore to look at it, and lo and behold, that's what it was. Dale, you've mentioned the non-evasive ways that we can find out what is in the ground or below it. Other than that, we've got to wait for very bad storms that knock trees over. Why is that? Well, because you're dealing with a location that there were many, many people were killed during that explosion. At least 270 people were killed during that explosion. The explosion scattered human remains over an area of about one square mile. You're dealing with a very sensitive site because it is a sacred site. Literally, the entire site is one big human burial ground. Many people, both descendants of the Maroons who were killed there, descendants of Native Americans, and there are also descendants of Europeans who were buried there after this explosion, who we don't know exactly where their graves are very sensitive about people going in there and just digging, whether they be archaeologists or anyone else. Just don't feel good about people digging where their ancestors' remains might be. I'm very sensitive about that. I know my friend Matt Shack, who is a historian who's a descendant of Maroons, he just feels that the whole site is one big cemetery. 
and should be left alone in terms of digging. You run into this issue of which is more important, the bodies of human beings or a handful of artifacts. So that leads us to toppled trees. Yeah, archaeologists go in when a tree gets toppled, then what they do, they don't actually dig in the ground. What they do is they dig in the roots of the trees um, and then replace the earth back into the ground where the earth came from. And so they actually screen the earth out of the roots of the trees and place that earth back into the ground to fill in the hole where the earth and the tree roots came from. So they're not actually digging in the ground. They're actually digging in the upturned roots of the trees and then placing that earth back into the ground. It's a very sensitive topic. The Seminole tribe opposes any digging on the site. I personally and philosophically oppose any digging on the site. There are people who favor digging there, and there are people who oppose digging there. It just kind of depends on philosophically and religiously where you fall. What have they found when they do look at the roots from upturned trees? What they have found is fairly minor. They found a few musket balls. They found some broken bits of pottery, some pieces of china, things like that. To be honest with you, I don't think they found as much as they were expecting to find, but they did find a few bits and pieces. I can tell you, in my opinion, that back in the 50s and 60s, the site was swept pretty clean by relic hunters, both before and during the time that it was a state park. I've talked to a few long retired metal detectorists who swept the site pretty clean back in the day. And they tell me that even when it was a state park, they were allowed to go in there with metal detectors. They've told me a lot about what they found in there back then. And the site was a metal detectorist paradise back in the 1950s and 60s. Today, when they went into those tree roots and excavated, they did not find as much as I think they expected to find. Well, what do you lose when the metal detectorists sweep an area before archaeologists get to it? And why should they just not do it? You lose information. Number one, at this place, is federal property, and you'll get arrested and sent to federal prison. That's number one reason not to do it. There's security on the site. There's security cameras there, and they will find you, and they will arrest you. Number two, think about it in terms of these are sacred places. In a case like this where you have human remains and human burials there, you really are treading on sacred ground. Number three, it destroys information that is buried in the ground. You may think, well, there's great stuff there. There's also information that that material that's in the ground, by removing that material from where it's located, you prevent ever learning anything about where that material was buried. By removing a button or a buckle or even a nail from where it was located, then an archaeologist will never be able to determine what type of building that nail was associated with or where that button was located at. You prevent anyone from ever learning the information that that nail was associated with. And that's why it's really very simple when it comes down to it. You can't ever learn anything about that building that that artifact was associated with. Now that's for the fort at Prospect Bluff. What about Nichols Outpost? No, it is very sensitive site simply because it was built on top of a prehistoric Native American mound. So any artifacts that have been found there have been surface finds. They have been found on top of the ground. We do not do any digging at the site. All of the archaeology that has been done there has been done using ground penetrating radar or geophysical means like electronic equipment and LIDAR and things of that nature. We do not do any digging at the site simply because it is on top of a prehistoric mound. This is on top of a Native American mound and this is a large temple mound and it's sacred and we do not do any digging at the site. But we have learned a lot from the ground penetrating radar that was done, showed us where there's a stockade line, so we know it's there. And we believe that in the future, with technology developing as rapidly as it is, we'll be able to see more and more and more in the future. Okay, Dale, 
What are some future projects you're working on? Well, I'll tell you quickly, one project that we have going that's going to be starting in December is at the site of Holmestown. And Holmestown, if you ever have seen the wonderful world of Disney things, and everybody remembers Davy Crockett, and everybody remembers because everyone had to run around getting the uh, coonskin caps when the Davy Crockett series was famous back in the 50s and the early 60s. And you remember that Davy Crockett went into Florida chasing Chief Red Stick. Well, Chief Red Stick was based on a real-life individual whose name was Holmes. And Holmes was a Red Stick who came into Florida. He was a chief, and he came into Florida following the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. And he settled up in northwest Florida in the Panhandle, and he settled at a place called Holmestown, the location of which had never been known until just in recent years when it was revealed by trees toppled after Hurricane Michael. We found Holmestown in the wake of Hurricane Michael. The first archaeological project at Holmestown is going to be starting in December. I'll come back once that project gets underway in December, and I'll bring the archaeologist who is leading the project and we'll tell you all about the work that is going to be taking place Holmestown once it gets underway. We're going to be doing our first project at the site of Holmestown, which was burned by American forces, including Davy Crockett, during the War of 1812. This one that everyone will be able to relate to based on that old Disney series. And it's up in the Panhandle. It's in Washington County, Florida. And we're very excited to get that project underway. It's about 50 miles west of each of them. It's between those two forts and Pensacola. And it's right dead center in the middle of the panhandle due north of Panama City Beach. Has 2 Egg TV done Nichols Outpost yet? We have not done Nichols Outpost yet, but we're going to be doing it shortly as the work gets underway here on the mound restorations at the site. Well, Del Cox, once again, thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars Authority. Uh, well, I've really enjoyed it, and it's all about getting it right, and it's about informing people so that they can get involved and be a part of what we're trying to do. This podcast is copyright 2022, the Seminole Wars Foundation, all rights reserved. Find us on the web at seminolewars.podbean.com or seminolewars.us. Front and back bumper music courtesy of the U.S. Navy Band.